Well, welcome. My name is Brad Evans. I'm the pastor of Family Ministries and Congregational Care here at Grace Bible Church. So if I haven't met you, it's uh, great to meet you. And uh, let me fix that. Sorry, Gary. Um, so today we'll be looking at Psalm 139. I invite you, if you're not already there, to turn to Psalm 139. This is a great passage. Brian, when he, was, uh, when he asked me if I would fill in for him, he said, whatever you want to pick, you pick. So I've been thinking about this for a few weeks, and Psalm 139 is where I landed. And I'm so glad because the Lord has really encouraged me through his word uh, as I've been meditating and preparing this for the last several weeks. Psalm 139, can I trust God? Can I trust him? What do you think? Can we, is, can we trust God? Do you ever ask that question? She says, yes, I like that. Um, we all have times that we wonder about that, don't we? Can I trust God? Trust is the foundation of all relationships. Trust is the foundation of all relationships. So let me ask you this. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Well, if you don't know me, you better not say yes. Because we only trust to the degree to which we know someone. Right? And there's some of you I've known longer than others, and some of you... Bob and I were in a Bible study together for a men's study for a couple of years. Bob, do we trust each other pretty well, don't we? Yeah, thumbs up. We trust one another because we got to know each other. My wife was in the first service, and I mentioned this, but we've been married 28 years. We just celebrated 28 years of marriage in December. Do we trust one another? Well, I hope so. And yes, we do, but I can tell you there are times in our marriage that I was not fully honest with her. There are times that I hurt her, causing her to not trust me. You know what I'm talking about. People have hurt you, causing distrust. Trust being the foundation of all relationships, God wants us to know that, yes, we can trust him. But he doesn't want us just to take a blind leap of faith. He wants to reveal himself to us through his word. He wants us to know what he's like. He wants us to know his character, that I am trustworthy. And he wants to take us by the hand, and he wants to lead us. And that's what I love about this psalm, because we're going to learn a lot about what God is like. Psalm 139 is a wisdom psalm. It's a psalm written to give us instruction about a wise way to live our lives and about truth about who God is, about his character. It's also a very personal psalm. David is writing this not in third person. He's writing about his own relationship with God. God created you and me so that we could enter into a relationship with him for a purpose, so that we could know him, so that we could make him known. There's no accident we're here. There's no accident that you, it's no accident that you're here this morning. And King David wants us to know about his God. First word in the psalm, O Lord, Yahweh. The covenantal name of God with his people. A name that can be trusted. I am that I am. David wants us to know his God, which can be our God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Very personal. Uh, As it mentions here, Lord, God, we find it 35 times, or a pronoun referring to the Lord or God. And David referring to I, me, my, 47 times. So we see this back and forth as David is having this dialogue with God, and he writes this as a poem for the nation of Israel and for us today about what is true about God. Ravi Zacharias um, Amazing teacher, uh, preacher. I get his newsletter electronically. But his last one was titled, and he's talking about all the mess we have in the world because we live in a broken, fallen world, right? And he says, as Christians, truth is our most powerful weapon. Truth is our most powerful weapon. God wants to reveal 
truth to us this morning about who he is and about who we are and what that relationship of trust is to look like. And that's why it's very personal, as David writes. We're going to see four sections, four paragraphs, or the Hebrew phrase is strophes of six verses each. It's beautiful. It's poetic. It's rhythmic. It's a wonderful section of literature. It's also the inspired Word of God written to you and to me. I don't know of any other section of Scripture that reveals more of God's character. I know it's the most in the Psalms. And I know there's many teaching in the epistles that talk about God's nature and who he is. But this is the summit right here. What what does it mean when we talk about God's attributes? It's the distinguishing characteristics of God that set him apart and through which he reveals himself to mankind. It's like, what's so-and-so like? I see Bruce here. What's Bruce like? Well, you'd go on and describe him, what he's like. Well, what's God like? Well, he's going to reveal himself. These are his attributes. These are his characteristics that are unique to God being God. And we're not God. He wants us to know that. Psalm 100 talks about that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He's the creator. We're the creation. Can I trust God? Well, we're going to see in our first section that God knows everything. Yes, we can trust him. Let's look here in Psalm 139, verse 1. David writes, O Lord, Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. Let's talk about in the past. said, God, you've searched me and you know everything about me. You know me completely. You know me fully. Now let's look at the present tense. Verse 2. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. He's going to talk about some extremes. When I sit down, when I rise up. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Verse 3. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. You understand my thought from afar. He's not talking about um, proximity. He's talking about time. From the beginning of time. God, you knew me. You knew that you would create me. You knew what I would be like. You knew, in my, you knew my purpose in life. In verse 3, you scrutinize or you winnow my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Not some. He knows everything about us. Every detail. Look at this, verse 4. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. How's that make you feel that God knows your words even before you speak them? We're going to see a passage here in just a minute about He knows our thoughts before we think them, our words. He even knows our motives of why we do things. How's that make you feel? For those of us that know Him and are walking closely with Him, and have nothing to hide, it is a wonderful comfort to us. But for those of us who are trying to hide, those of us who have secrets, those of us who have unconfessed sin, it should strike some fear in our hearts, right? Of reverence and worship that, wow, this is a big God. I can't hide from him. And that's what happens with David. Because as he realizes how God has known him and how he knows everything about him, it absolutely blows him away. It blows his circuits. Look at verse 5. Here's his response. You've enclosed me behind and before. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain to it. The Bible Sometimes we'll refer to God in human terms, and it says, God, you're so blowing me away. What I feel like is your hand. I feel feel like an ant, and your hand has enclosed me. Now, does God have a hand? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he has a million of them. I don't know. But David is describing this in terms that we can understand. What would it feel like if we're enclosed? 
Because what David's saying again, God, you know everything. And that realization, it's like you're running a bazillion volts through my 220 volt circuit here. It's more than I can handle. And that's why he's responding this way. You've enclosed me behind and before you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. In the Hebrew text, the first word of that phrase is wonderful. Striking emphasis on the fact that our all-knowing God is wonderful. That he's that powerful. You're wonderful. This now it's, it's too high. You're blowing me away, God. I can't attain to it. God knows everything. Let's look at some other passages of Scripture that talk about God knowing all. I mentioned this, Psalm 94, 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. In Matthew 10, this is in a section where Jesus Christ is teaching that we don't need to be afraid. He's talking about the sparrows and how God knows the sparrows. And if he knows them, aren't I going to take care of you? And Jesus said, The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, for some of us, that's getting a little fewer and fewer, right? As time goes on. But the realization is he knows exactly every detail about us. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians, this one really gets me. Wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness. And not only does he know our thoughts before we think them and our words before we think them, He will disclose the motives of of men's hearts, why we do things. Whoa. Again, how does that make you feel? Can you see now why David's going, God, you're blowing me away. This is too much. But it also, you're going to see as we go through this psalm, it brings him great comfort to know that he has such a powerful God like this. God knows everything. Yes, we can trust him because he's all-knowing. The theological term is omniscient. God knows everything. He's also everywhere. Look at verse 7. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Now, he's going to use some opposites again. That's a literary device of, called merisms, where we're going to see some extremes so that he's going to show us that the totality of everywhere, God, you're there. If I ascend to heaven, God, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol or the underworld, whoa, God, you're even there. Behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn... Were any of you up early enough this morning to see the sunrise? It's a beautiful sunrise. So the sun comes up from the east, and the rays of the dawn go west, right? So what's David saying? How fast is the speed of light? Anybody know? 186,000 miles per second. A little trivia there. Is that fast? That's booking it, Right? What David is saying is even if, and did he know it was 186,000 miles? I don't know if he knew or not. Even if I take the wings of the dawn and I fly as fast as the speed of light, and wherever I end up, God, you're already there. There's no place I can go that you're you're not already present. Omnipresence is the theological term. If I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, you're there too, God. What's the remotest part of the sea? We know it's the Marianas Trench. It's over seven miles deep. If you could figure out a way to get down there, God would be there. He's everywhere. Look at verse 10. Even there your hand will lead me. Again, he's using the hand image. Your hand will lead me. This is uh, referring to what David is talking about in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Again, understanding about God's attributes and his character. If we're not walking with him, it can kind of freak us out. It's like, oh my gosh. But for his children, and he's saying, will you take my hand? 
let me lead you. I will lead you to the everlasting way. You can trust me. He's a good God. It gives us tremendous comfort. Even there, your hand will lead me. And now he's not just talking about any hand. He's talking about the sword hand, which is the right hand of strength and power. So protection, your right hand will lay hold of me. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. There's something about the dark that is a little creepy, isn't it? Right? That's why we have night lights. Any of y'all have any of y'all admit to having a night light? We got one in our hallway so we don't trip. Well, the dark can bring things to our imagination and fears that just doesn't happen in the light, right? Um, a couple years ago, I, I love to hunt. Those of you who know me, you know I enjoy that. I enjoyed doing that with my kids. My son and I were deer hunting, and it was an afternoon hunt, and we hunted till it was absolutely dark. And we were walking back to the truck, and I told my son, I said, hey, Andrew, we know the way. There's a little bit of moonlight. Let's not use our flashlights. Let's just kind of ease along in the dark towards the truck. So we were going along, and... Uh, we heard some rustling ahead of us, kind of going, whoa. Then we started hearing a lot of rustling. And then, so we got our, whatever's happened has got our attention now. Then we hear, Wee! we had walked right into a herd of wild hogs in the dark. Hello, flashlight's on. Guess who could run faster, dad or son, you know? <laughs> If it had been daylight, that would have been no big deal. First of all, we would have seen them. Stuff happens at night. Kind of gets us scared. God wants us, or David wants us to know, hey, it's okay. In your greatest fear, the darkness is light to God. He sees all. He's there for you. He's your comfort. You can trust him. He's everywhere. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him? Jeremiah asks. What's the answer? Of course not. He sees all. He knows all. He's everywhere. In fact, in the Great Commission, Jesus Christ is saying, go and make disciples of all nations, but he wants us to know that we're not alone. He says, lo, I will be with you always. 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 And in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. You ever feel alone? You ever wonder, does anyone know what's going on? Does, is anyone aware of this hurt I have? Does anyone care? I, uh, over the course of my weeks, I get to meet with a lot of people, and it's interesting that this theme will often come up with people when we're gut level honest. That sometimes we, we feel alone. Even when we know, even as believers, we can feel by ourselves. Uh, my mom's a widow. We went to visit her uh, at Christmas time. And my mom's a very outgoing person, but she struggles with being alone. She needs to be reminded of what's true. I will never leave you or forsake you. Again, God created us to be in relationship with himself. We, we are sinful. We need to recognize that he has provided a savior, his son, Jesus Christ. He demonstrated his love towards us. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we believe that, we receive his free gift of salvation. Old things pass away, new things have come. And you know what happened? Whew. His Spirit comes and lives within us. Our bodies are temples of His Holy Spirit. And He will never, ever leave us or forsake us. That's what eternal security is all about. We are secure. We are safe in the Father's arms. Can we trust Him? Absolutely. Yes. We can take it to the bank. We can have confidence in our relationship with God. 
And that those times where you feel alone, or maybe even if you're here this morning and in a crowd, you feel like nobody gets you, God gets you. He wants you to come to him and just acknowledge your need for him. We're all needy, broken people. We need him. And we need to be reminded of his greatness, his grandeur, that he not only knows everything, that he's everywhere, and he's right here, right here. And we need to reprogram our minds. Romans 12, 2 talks about renewing our minds and speak truth about who God is. And just say that to ourselves, speak truth, because the accuser, Satan, wants us to believe that we're alone and that nobody cares and that God doesn't even know what's going on. He knows. He cares. He's asking us to trust him. So, God not only knows everything, not only is he everywhere, we're going to see that he's all-powerful. And we're about to embark in the most clear teaching, the most powerful section of Scripture on the sanctity of life and how valued you are, how valued I am to God. Look at verse 13. David writes, For you, God, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. There's intentionality There's divine design. It's not just some accident. God not only created the world, he created you and me intentionally with purpose. There's no accident. There's no mistake. Verse 14, look at David's response, and this should be our response. As we grasp, as we come to grips with the wonder of how he's created us, it should lead us to worship. Look at what David says. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. He's not just talking about creation in general. He's saying, wonderful are your works, as he's looking at himself. Now, this is not pride. This is not arrogant. This is a healthy awareness of who we are and how God has made us. And for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, who we are in Christ. Again, we need to remember this. We need to remind ourselves. Write scripture out on your mirror where you will see it. Memorize God's word. Because as the accuser comes to you and says those things, you know those those tapes that we play in the back of our minds? I'm showing my age here. I guess they're MP3s now, whatever they are. But those memories that we have, you know, that you're not going to amount to anything, that you can't do it, that you're fat or you're skinny or you're this or you're that. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I've been going through a study with some people. It's a great lay counseling training, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hand by uh, David Tripp. Uh, Check it out. We'll be offering it again in the fall. But he makes this statement. It's really true. You know whose voice we hear most during the day? It's our own. It's self-talk. It's self-speak. And we may not be talking out loud, or you may be driving down Texas and talking out loud, and people kind of looking at you going, oh, that guy's weird. But we talk to ourselves. We think thoughts about ourselves all the time. And a lot of them are lies from the world, lies from the accuser. God wants us to have an accurate appraisal of who we are and to speak truth And if it'll help you, get some phrases like this and say them over and over during the course of your day. For example, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How does that make you feel? That God with intentionality has made you and me. Fearfully, there's a sense of awe with how we're made. And there's a sense of wonder with the, the unique personality and design and gifts he has given you and me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's say that together. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. One more time. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. That's true. Because that's what God says about us. And David says, my soul knows it very well. Deep 
in the recesses of my inner being. I get it, God. I get it. Verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. That's a metaphor for the womb, the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Even before we were born, God saw us, knew us, knew everything about us, knew every detail. That's his design. That's his creation. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as, when as yet there was not one of them. You realize that we cannot die one day before our appointed time, and we cannot live one day beyond our appointed time. God has a plan. And every day he has ordained for us individually. In Psalm 90, Moses writes, Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Teach us to be good stewards of these days that you have given us. But whether our life is short or long, God, I don't know, but you're in control. You're sovereign. You're all-powerful. You created me. And I don't understand why sometimes a baby passes. I don't know. But God, I'm going to choose to trust you. We, we lost a child. I don't know. But God, I'm going to trust you with that. Or why some people live to be 100. I don't know. But God, every day you have ordained for me, you have purpose, you have design for me, and I'm going to live this day knowing I'm fearfully and wonderfully made with intentionality. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. That word precious could be translated how valuable, how rare, how costly are your thoughts to me. Is it just a few of them? Does he just have a few thoughts about how cool you are? Look at verse 18. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, I'm still with you. God has an infinite number of thoughts about us. And he knows. And he's in control. He's all-powerful. At Christmas time, uh, I mentioned we went to see my mom. And uh, we traveled up on the 26th, the day after Christmas, and we got into a huge Midwestern storm. Uh, in fact, it was a storm of record. It rained a foot in 24 hours, a foot of rain. So when I got up to my mom's house and saw her and went to bed, and that next day I was looking forward to getting up and walking out on the family farm and just kind of, you know, seeing the cattle and walking around. And this is what I saw. It's not a lake. This is a field, a wheat field, underwater. Spring River is normally about 40 or 50 yards wide. wide. It was over a mile wide. Another picture of utter devastation. People drowned. Fences my grandfather had built 50 and 60 years ago washed out. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so as I'm, I'm taking this picture here, as I get up my first morning in Missouri, and I'm going, God, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm thinking about the cost to repair this. I'm thinking about the erosion, thinking about the wheat crop. So gamut of emotions, anger, fear, worry, anxiety, and I promise you, I was standing here right on this spot after I took this picture asking God, what in the world are you doing? And I thought about that I'm going to be preaching <laughs> in however many days that was on Psalm 139 about God is sovereign and he is in control. And I stood there with water lapping at my feet and I said, God, this is your farm. I give this to you. Was it easy? No. But he needed to remind me of what is true. That he's working. And in fact, where it talks about God has created us and we're fearfully and wonderfully made, aren't you glad he's not through with us now? And he's still working. And as a potter, he's shaping us. 
And he wants us to be soft and receptive. Because, see, I could, I could walk away. In fact, right now, I could get pretty, you know what I mean. We can go there. Or we can say, God, you're using this flood of my life or this drought of my life or this lack of finances in my life or whatever is going on in my life, God, you are using this to shape me. And as the potter, I recognize that. You're my sovereign. Let me be soft clay so that you can shape me. Because, God, I trust you. I don't feel like it right now. I didn't feel like it then. But, God, I know you're good. I know you have my best interest in mind. God knows everything. He, uh, he's everywhere. He's all-powerful. So can we trust him? What do you think? Yes. Yes, we can trust him. Absolutely, we can trust him. And he wants us in a minute to ask him to search our heart, but before he gets there, this psalm is going to take an interesting turn. Look at verse 19. Remember, David is a warrior. He may have been recently in battle. We don't know. But in verse 19, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. For they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They become my enemies. What in the world? What David is saying is, God, I've grown so close to you. I have such confidence in you. I have such trust in you. I am absolutely loyal to you, God. I will fight for you. I will stand up for you. As civilians, we may not understand that as much. For those of you who've been in the military, you get this. Okay. So David is issuing a battle cry that he's willing to fight for God, for God's name's sake. David is loyal to his God. He wants us to know that. That's a response of fidelity, of trust, of confidence, of loyalty as God has moved in his life. God, I hate those who who hate you. So, yes, we can trust him. Yes, God knows everything. He's everywhere. He's all-powerful. Um, but there's more. Now there's application. This is where God wants to take us after he has revealed his attributes, his character, that, yes, you can trust me. He is asking us to be honest with him. He's asking us to be genuine with him, to be real with him, to come clean to not have any secrets. Listen to David's words. And I'm going to tell you, he's a brave man with praying this, and it takes courage to pray this. In verse 1, he's already said, God, you've searched me and known me, but now he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, or you could be translate that, refine me, remove the dross from the silver. Try me, know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful or painful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. What's he saying? God, I've seen who you are. You've revealed yourself to me. You've blown yourself, you've blown me away with the understanding of how great a God you are, and that you would choose a relationship with me. God, for that to work, you know everything about me, But God, I need for you to reveal some things about me, maybe even some blind spots that I'm not seeing. Uh, Where it talks about and see if there be any hurtful way. A hurtful way was an idolatrous path. It was a path towards idol worship. And I think what David's saying here is, God, do I have any idols in my life? Things that I'm worshiping that I put ahead of you? Would you reveal that to me? Because, God, I need to confess that as sin. I need to repent from that. And I need to turn from it and ask you to forgive me and restore the sweetness 
of my fellowship with you. And that's what's so powerful about this psalm is we're not just talking about great head knowledge and knowing about how great God is, which is true. But it's very personal and relational. And he wants to take us to that place right now where we have nothing to hide. And we come clean before him. And we confess our sin. And we're honest with him. And when I do this in my life, I promise you I've seen no greater progress in my growth as a believer than when I'm honest. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in his spirit there's no deceit. God blesses the person that doesn't have deceit, hidden stuff in our lives, and we come clean, and we bear our soul. He also blesses us if we confess our sins one to another, James 5, that you may be healed. We're in community with one another. We say, hey, I'm struggling. I, I need help. I'm hurting. I, I, I said some ugly things to my wife, whatever it may be. So church family, what we're going to do right now is Tim is going to lead and guide us to a time of response. And I want to ask us, this is just between us and God, to be still before him. And as a prayer, God, would you search my heart? Would you reveal anything in my life Then I need to come clean with you so that we can be close, we can be tight, and we can grow? God, would you, would you lead me? And I'm, Daddy, I'm just going to jump into your arms because I trust you.